The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, wherever you are, or even good evening, wherever you are. This is Michael Gallagher. I am the uh, this year's president of the School of Management Alumni Chapter at George Mason University. Uh, that's my um, often my evening job, sometimes my day job. My regular day job is as president and founder of uh, the Stevie Awards, uh, which organizes the American Business Awards and the Stevie Awards for Women in Business, among other programs. So good day, and thank you for joining us. Uh, it is uh, Thursday, January 27th, and this is our second uh, webinar. Uh, those of you who follow activities with the George Mason University uh, School of Management alumni chapter know that we started this webinar series in November. This is our second webinar. We hope to do it monthly. Uh, and uh, our uh, interview subject uh, this afternoon is Wendy Goldsmith, who is the uh, founder and CEO of the Bioengineering Group in Salem, Massachusetts. She's a multiple uh, Stevie Award winner. And uh, through the miracle of uh, web webinar technology, she is participating in her call today on her BlackBerry in a car at the side of a snowy road in Boston. How are you, Wendy? Yes, and if you hear a little background noise, that's the guy who just showed up with a snowblower for the sidewalk next to us. <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're glad that you're a trooper and that you're able to... Uh, to make it on our call today uh, one way or another. Uh, we're also joined um, by my colleague Ann White. Uh, say hello, Ann. Yes, hi everyone. My snow drifts uh, outside. I'm not in the car, thank goodness. Uh, Ann will be um, uh, sorting through the questions that we will pose to, to Wendy from you at, at the end of this session today. I expect it will take it 40, 45 minutes in total, including the Q&A. Uh, in your GoToWebinar um, control panel, uh, you should see a chat function that will enable you to pose questions that you would like us to address to Wendy on your behalf. And uh, at the end of our discussion with Wendy, uh, Anne will sort through those and, and, and pose the most compelling ones to Wendy for you. Um, typically, at the beginning of these um, uh, webinar like this, we will simply ask the, the uh, the interview subject to tell us about themselves, but before we do that, because we are going to get to that, um, we do have a couple of polls that we want to... Michael, the sound is... Hello? Hello, Michael. Can you hear me? I just wanted to say the sound is breaking up at my end. I don't know if it's happening at your end. Okay, I, I can hear you fine. I, I don't know whether others can hear me as well, but we, we do have a couple of polls, and the first poll we want to, po we want to, um, to pose is asking our attendees, whether or not they are George Mason University School of Management alumni. Uh, so if you would, uh, just take a second to, uh, to complete this poll. We'll leave it open for about 20 seconds or so. And um, any more responses? OK. And uh, there we have our results. Uh, looks like roughly 60% of you are alumni and 40% uh, are not. So those of you who are not welcome, uh, we did do a quite a bit of promotion about the webinar across the web. So welcome. We hope you enjoy uh, our conversation with Wendy today. Um, so Wendy, I have some questions for you, but you, you shared with us some videos uh, that you'd like us to show the audience. And uh, the first one is a nice little uh, three-minute overview about yourself and um, and the bioengineering gr group that's on uh, YouTube. So I'm going to show that video right now. Thanks, Michael. I'm Wendy Goldsmith, and I started bioengineering group back in 1992. At that point, I had a passion for handling water resources wisely in a built environment. I saw nobody else was doing it. A lot of construction practices change how the land absorbs and processes water. And if you just understood how natural systems worked, you could shepherd the water on a site more effectively with lots of ecological benefits as well as cost savings. Bioengineering Group started out doing work on pretty small scale uh, research and development type things, doing pilot scale demonstration type projects, 
bit by bit, we went from a small size to a, well, I believe this can work. Clients were trusting us to work on a larger level to the point where we're actually in a leading role for design and program management on the single largest public infrastructure projects going on in North America right now, down in Greater New Orleans. My favorite part about running this business has always been bringing together teams of talented, dedicated people. Our mission is building sustainable communities on an ecological foundation. I recently had the pleasure of running into someone that I'd met with very early on in bioengineering group's history. He said, Wendy, you came in, you told me about all the services you were offering, you had this vision, and I could tell you were really clear and really pumped up, but I just shook my head and I said, she's going to fail. There's, I know this industry. And he said, boy, was I wrong. You predicted this green design movement before anybody else saw it coming. You built your skill set and you're known for it and you've really been practicing this stuff just as the rest of the industry has learned its importance. In 2008, we doubled our number of staff and our revenues. In 2009, we doubled again. 2010 is off to an excellent beginning with the win of a $30 million contract. I've loved being presented with many different challenges and trying to find ways through problems like not having enough money, trying to design something that's never been designed before, trying to convince clients to travel well outside their comfort zone. And doing all of these different things simultaneously we added the even larger challenge. And uh, juggling is fun. I've enjoyed all the juggling. And I can say with pride I'm good at it too. Well, thank you for that for sending us that uh, that video, Wendy. Um, are you still there? I'm still here. Okay. And, uh, now that everyone has gotten a little overview, hopefully it launched us into some good discussion. Okay. Well, you also sent us some um, uh, some uh, photographs of of you and your staff in action. And, and while we're talking, I'm going to put those on a um, on a loop here so people can see you and, and your staff. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of the video that um, your, uh, I forget your words, but something along the lines of your passion for clean, clean water inspired you to create the Bioengineer Group. Where did that passion come from? Tell, me, tell us about your background and how you, how you got to the point where you made that decision. Sure. Uh, when I was an undergraduate student at Yale University, uh, one of my work one of my summer jobs was actually doing some field science work in, in the experimental forest that is part of the UN Biosphere Reserve Program and it's one of the global points where our, our, how our planet functions is actually being studied. And I was part of some of these studies, rubbing elbows with some of the people who actually discovered that acid rain happens and who were tracking the, how climate change was happening. And as I was talking with these folks, it became really crystal clear to me well, that they were trying to get me to be going on, getting my doctorate and becoming a research scientist like they were. And I, I realized there's plenty of scientific knowledge out there. What's missing is the connection that helps put more of it into everyday practice. You know, there's so many things we already know we could be doing differently. What's missing is the practical, economically effective, culturally feasible ways to start doing it. And we're still facing a lot of those challenges, but for me, I wanted to be involved in uh, work that put the acupuncture needle right into that point to help harvest the benefit of many other people's scientific research and put it right into the field of construction and operations where buildings and infrastructure and all kinds of facilities of many scales could be managed um, in light of everything we've learned about how, how our planet works and how it needs to work better. 
Okay, but before I, I go on and ask you some more questions about your background and, and the founding of Bioengineering Group, uh, we have a, a, a second uh, poll, and I'm going to launch it here. And uh, for those of you listening in today, uh, this question is, is about um, you know, why are you here today? What is it you're, you're interested in learning about? I think you can, you can choose more than one of these options. And the four options are you want to hear Wendy talk about entrepreneurship. Uh, you want to learn about her management style and how she learned to be a manager. Uh, your interest is in green technology in general. Or you want to learn more about Wendy and the bioengineering group. Um, so, so take a moment and complete that poll. And here, here's a photo. We just saw a photo of you with, uh, with, with Warren Buffett, Wendy. How and where did you meet Warren Buffett? <laughs> well, um, I was very, very delighted last fall to be chosen as one of the ten uh, groundbreaking, great, game-changing women entrepreneurs by Fortune magazine. And we were honored at a special event in D.C. back in October. And... Uh, there was, it was part of the Fortune Most Powerful Women Summit, which is an invitation-only group of about 400 women. But the we 10 entrepreneurs got to have dinner with Warren Buffett and actually had some great opportunity for one-on-one -on -one conversation with him. And he's every bit the fine character one hears of. He's even better in person, I would say. It was very impressive and pleasing to meet him and talk with him. Okay, we've closed our poll. and. Um, 100% of attendees today are interested in hearing you talk about um, basically issues related to entrepreneurship, so how you started, uh, how you started your business. 71% are interested in, in, in the green technology movement. 43% uh, are interested in, in hearing you talk about how you developed your management style, and just about a third are interested in, um, in the bioengineering group. So thank you all for participating in that. Um, I think we've run through all of our, our uh, photos here. Uh, so I'll, I'll show people your home page. Um, all right, so you, you told us about your education and, and, and where your interest intersected with your education to, to lead you to believe there was an opportunity for you. But, but as you said in, in the video, when, when, when you got to this point in, in, uh, in 1992, there was nobody else doing this. It's, was this your first business venture? That's a good question. Um, I do come from a family with a substantial number of entrepreneurs, some of whom have actually built sizable entrepreneurial businesses, some of whom just sort of led sole proprietor consulting practices, either after retiring from a career or as a career. So somehow growing up, I always kind of felt like the entrepreneurial lifestyle was a known entity to me. Um, um, when I finished, you know, I actually have two undergrads, two bachelor's degrees and two master's degrees. And when I finished my first master's degree, I went, I, I went to work for a very large engineering firm in Boston. And I found the atmosphere so stifling and so uncreative that I realized I was not going to be very happy working there. And I went and I got myself into a formal apprenticeship program with Germany's leading river restoration engineering firm. And while I was over there, I was working on some incredibly fast-paced projects right after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Everything about that was like a crash course in science and engineering, and also, frankly, how to structure some of the stakeholder relations and business operations of the venture that was doing this work. So it wasn't just the technical stuff, it was the business and community interaction as, as well that I learned on the fly in a foreign language. <laughs> and at the prospect of returning from that year-long apprenticeship and going back to a stifling job environment, I just said, no, that's not going to work. I said, I know, I'll just start my own company. <laughs> And in hindsight, I can only poke fun at myself and laugh, because although I did have some inkling of what I was getting into, if I knew then what I know now, I'm not really sure <laughs> to repeat it. Um, that being said, I, I think I do have a lot of what it takes 
to persevere through all of the trials and tribulations of being an entrepreneur. And you know, we did. We've gone through a couple of um, stages of evolution and growth, and we've really stuck it out. Um, this is our 20th year in business, so we've had staying power, and we've had an increasingly high degree of influence too in our field. So when you started when you started the business, not only did you not have any entrepreneurial experience, despite the fact that you've got many entrepreneurs in your family, um, you didn't really have a lot of management experience. Is that correct? Oh yes, I I'm, I I got through college without taking a single course in business or management or economics. So you started you decided to start a a new business that was also is you are in essence creating a new industry with your new business is that correct that's pretty accurate yeah uh, and I, I suspect if you had if you had had entrepreneurial experience or probably prior management experience the prospect of starting a new industry probably would have daunted you more than it did I think that's quite true and um, as that little video snippet you rolled included you know you told the story of somebody that I met with early on to make an introductory call on this city planner who said, wow, this, you know, she's talking about all these things, but I did this industry and there's no way it's going to succeed. This business will not, you know, this business will not, this business is going to fail. And that was not the only message I got like that, but fortunately, I also received, uh, not only did I land on my feet getting business in my first year, but I got a lot of repeat business, and I managed, I, I was knocking on doors and doing business with organizations that, again, if I knew better, I would have known it was impossible to get business with the Army Corps of Engineers as a tiny one-woman outfit. <laughs> but since I didn't know it was impossible, I did it. <laughs> um, and, and a lot of the projects started on were fairly small scale, but they were pioneering, they put the benchmark in place, and they've allowed a lot of further advancement to be built upon. And by hooking in with the research and development, research into practice community within the federal government, it's really, it gave us a lot of credibility early on, and also gave us, frankly, the best kind of clients we could wish for, who are the forward-leaning, risk embracing innovators as opposed to the risk averse, excessively cautious government bureaucrat types who are also out there in mm -hmm. the instrument sector. Now how did you finance the startup of the business? Ah, well, that's a good question as well. Um, uh, every every trick in the book. Um, stupidly racking up credit card debt line of credit on the house, angel investors with formally structured loans and investments, um, informal, desperate calls to family members to help make payroll, you know, all of the above. Mm -hmm. along, the, along the way, I also learned how to um, actually structure payments from clients to get suitable advance payments and retainers, often, again, <laughs> clients simply will not do that. It's not part of how payments are structured in this industry. It's not something this agency or customer ever does, but I learned how to get it to be done anyhow. Um, two years ago, I received a federal political appointment to serve on the National Women's Business Council. And over the last two years, I've been involved in a variety of summit meetings and national town hall meetings on behalf of the Women's Business Council, and one of the topics that we've looked at very closely and uh, conducted some research projects on has to do with women's, women entrepreneurs' access to capital and factors facilitating or inhibiting the growth of women-owned firms. And, you know, I am sort of the post, uh, I'm, I'm a classic case of how women wind up um, getting their company off the ground. And unlike a lot of women-owned firms, I eventually did manage to learn the art of tapping um, bank financing. But interestingly, women still lag far behind men among entrepreneurs 
in terms of their interest and their comfort level and their success at tapping bank financing. Mm -hmm. Women are often averse to entering into loans. They'd rather live without pay or kind of cobble the cash together as opposed to signing a big loan agreement. And um, often women are happy to keep their companies small as opposed to risking family assets or family harmony in pursuit of access to capital that would facilitate growth. Whereas most men who start businesses have growth as a set goal. Most women who start businesses, it turns out, do not necessarily put that out as a goal. Right. Well, we see that with our with our Stevie Awards programs, the, the, the types of organizations that participate in our awards for women in business um, tend to be uh, smaller service businesses that don't require as much capital to start up um, as many businesses that are started by men. So we see a lot of um, entries in the Women in Business Awards from advertising agencies and public relations agencies and business related consultancies that women can start from their kitchen table uh, without a lot of capital. My firm is pretty similar to that in the sense that it's a service-based industry with, um, you know, we sell science and engineering and landscape architecture consulting hours for the most part. Um, and so we're not a heavily collateralized business. This has always led to some uh, hesitation on the part of commercial lenders. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so we're very, um, my firm is a very classic service-based industry, typical of a woman entrepreneur. The difference, of course, is that science and engineering and construction are very substantially male-dominated fields. So sort of an outlier in that crowd. And very often, the only woman in the room or one of a very small subset sure. of women amongst large groups of people in my field. Now, before I ask you some questions about how you learn to be a manager and, and management in general, I'm going to ask you one final question related to entrepreneurship, and that is you've been an entrepreneur now for uh, about 20 years, uh, and I'm sure people have asked you this question before, so you probably have some ready answers. Um, what, what are the, the, the handful of pointers that if somebody asked you, you know, what are the main, most important things that you've learned about being an entrepreneur that you wish you had known before you got into the uh, into the business uh, and that you can impart to a, an aspiring entrepreneur, what, what are those handful of points that you'd like to make? Well, um, you, you summarized something earlier that if I knew everything that one should theoretically have had a grasp on, then I might have known enough not to start the business because I would have known how unlikely it was to succeed. So part of being an entrepreneur, I think, is having a hardwired blind that sort of issue. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think an entrepreneur has to be relentless and focused while also remaining very, very adaptable and being able to opportunistically and resourcefully rebound from adversity and change and things that just don't go according to plan. But meanwhile, you need a plan. And you need to be able to diligently pursue it. Um, you have to be an optimist and always come up with the next solution to the series of problems that you will find. And I think, you know, last but not least, I hear other people say, oh, that's too mushy. I don't think that you can really say that with a straight face. But I will say it. If you don't feel passionately about what you're doing, how on earth are you going to convince yourself, let alone others, to stand by and continue doing it when the going gets tough? Mm -hmm. You will have weekends away from your family, evenings away from your children, times when you're biting your nails wondering how the cash flow is going to work out. You never know what the future will bring and you have to be constantly working to conjure it and make it happen and to rally other people behind that. And if you don't feel the, the passion and conviction and if you don't telegraph that to everyone around you, you run out of steam pretty quickly and you're probably, you probably ought to question why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's let's talk now about your about your how you learned to be a manager. Um, uh, how many people does uh, Bioengineering Group currently uh, employ? Um, this year, our payroll number hit seventy-two. Oh, that's terrific! And uh, the first couple of years, uh, were, were you basically going it alone your first year? 
Uh, the first year I actually hired two employees. So I broke the mold for women-owned firms that way because I really did get set about the hiring staff and growing the company from day one. And um, very much part of my training and work background has been involving interdisciplinary teams with complementary technical training to work on very holistic and well-integrated planning and design processes. This involved a lot of stakeholder engagement and communication and coordination, which is often not the big feature in the engineering world, where often it's about computations and a linear thought process. It's about coming up with a technically best fit solution and often considering people's desires and even return on investment or how about ecological impact, both positive and negative. These have not been factors that traditional engineering decision process has taken into account very well. So one of, one of the strengths of bioengineering group's technical focus has been that it forces this kind of collaborative, interactive approach to solving project technical matters. And that turns into promoting a very fully engaged and collaborative approach to the management of the firm. We've always had a strong track record of involving people in setting our strategy, having, um, you know, obviously every, we have the business of the firm and then the business of the projects that the firm is contracted to perform. Mm -hmm. So we have a very collaborative process for both the project and for the larger effort, you know, the, the larger strategy of the firm. So a lot of my role has been about facilitating and coordinating and motivating. And that happens at the project level and, the, and at the firm level. And of course, we have a lot of other people on board who also possess those skills and talents and predilections. Now, you, you don't have a formal management education, is that correct? That is correct. And who were who your management models when, after you started the business? Well, I have had a very strong set of um, informal mentors. And, and frankly, one of the things that excites me a lot about the world of women entrepreneurship these days is that the networks where a woman can actually find other women who can mentor them on any number of pragmatic or highly personal topics, there, there is a network now. And 20 years ago when I started my firm, there really was not a network. Um, there were hardly any other women who were leading firms in my field. And there was a very strong sense that turning to them and having you know, spending too much time talking amongst each other would get us all blacklisted. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'm happy to say that that attitude has really gone the way of the dinosaur finally. But it's it's only a recent development, in my opinion. Um, so I had a, a variety of mentors, and, and they were mostly men. And there, there were a couple of women business owners that provided me everything from moral support to referrals to banks that actually would give a woman-owned firm a fair shake to you know, everything else that an entrepreneur needs to tap. Uh, let's talk about hiring. Um, you're obviously hiring highly educated, uh, intelligent, uh, in many cases, independent uh, people. How, how you, you developed your, your hiring skills? Well, you know, early on, it was probably not a very scientific or necessarily, uh, it wasn't always successful. One of the things that happened to us over and over again was we would hire people fresh out of a bachelor's degree program or a master's degree program. They would build some very highly tailored experience with the company, and then they'd go back to school. And this was a, actually a real drain on the company. And after a while, we started realizing that um, there were a bunch of reasons to hire people with just a little more education. One reason was because they would prolong their longevity with the company. And the other was that given our focus on strongly interdisciplinary work, hiring individuals who themselves 
are little multidiscipline packages with different academic degrees and work experience under their belt in different areas of practice helps make these people infinitely more effective at communicating across disciplinary boundaries. And so we we really started modifying our, our hiring process to, to, to strongly favor folks with higher degrees and degrees in different and complementary areas and work experience as well along those lines. All right. Just as earlier, I asked you uh, what, what, what pointers you would uh, offer a budding entrepreneur. Uh, what, what, what are the, uh, the two or three nuggets of wisdom that you've learned over the past 20 years about managing uh, particularly technical um, employees uh, that you could impart to uh, to a peer. Well, I do. I do think that trying to manage technical employees is is often really different from managing most other people in the sort of service based industry. Um, highly trained scientists and engineers are normally perhaps over-motivated. They all want to get an A on the project. They have the training, they have the motivation, and they will keep working on a project. It often requires a lot of discipline to help them learn how to focus on the budget and the schedule, that quality is important, but exceeding the level of quality your client is willing to pay for, or doing so in a way that blows the deadline. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, you, go, you don't get an A when you're in business from pouring on the quality over, you know, over the top. So that's one thing that, that we, we, we have to constantly focus on. And I think it's the opposite problem that a lot of people have nowadays, trying to motivate staff. We have to this is, you know, keep staff to focus their motivation within well-disciplined boundaries and, and still maintain all of the interdisciplinary communication. Oh, before we get to a question and answer and, and one more video that Wendy has provided us, we have one more poll, uh, which I'm going to launch here. And um, attendees, if you would uh, choose one of these, it's, what is your view on the green technology movement? First option is uh, it's definitely real and vital. Second option, you're not quite sure. Third option, and you're not sold. You think it's, it's a fad at the moment. So, so take a moment to look at that. Uh, and while that's running, we're going to queue up another video that Wendy has provided us about uh, her company and environmental sustainability in general. And um, OK, it looks like our poll is closed. And 100% of you are signed up uh, to the green technology movement. So good for you. We have an enlightened crowd today. Uh, so, Wendy, we're going to show your other video now. I think it's about two and a half minutes, and, and after that, we'll get to our question and answers, and we should be um, we should be right on schedule to finish up about 1:45. So, we'll go ahead and show this other video.
Well, thank you for those uh, those videos, Wendy. They were very um, uh, informative, and the last one was rather inspiring. Uh, are you there? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I missed you. Was that a question you asked? <laughs> no, no, no. I was just complimenting you on that video. Oh, thank you, Michael. Okay, I have about, um, I see 136 is the time, although I'm also seeing 142 on another device. So we're going to split the difference and we're assuming we're about 140. So we have about five minutes or so for questions. Um, and do we have questions from the audience? Well, I don't see any questions yet. Um, I don't know. I'm looking both at chat and questions on the... Uh... Okay. Well, those of you who are listening in, uh, by all means, if you have a question for Wendy, go ahead and pose it. Uh, in the meantime, I will pose some other questions of my own. Tell us a little bit more about your education, Wendy. You mentioned you have two undergraduate degrees and two master's degrees. What are those degrees in? Oh, I, I pretty much qualify as a geek. I have an environmental science degree and a geology and geophysics degree. I also have a land use planning and ecological design master's and a plant and soil science master's. And uh, what universities did you get those degrees? Um, I got my first two at Yale University, my next one at a school no one has ever heard of called the Conway School, and my fourth degree at University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Uh, and tell us about uh, the uh, the current state of business for bio bioengineering group. What 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 sort of trends are you seeing in the types of projects that are being presented to you? Well, as I hope that last little video managed to communicate, I think there is no type of project out there that doesn't have the opportunity and the proof to become an agent of positive ecological change and restoration. Um, even the most mundane and utilitarian seeming projects, if people consider that with a few subtle shifts, including things that often wind up saving money, um, more often than they cost money, projects can wind up having uh, long-term positive environmental impacts. And we've been doing this long enough for clients that maybe they don't recognize at first the subtle, power, subtle yet powerful impacts that our projects and our approach to projects have brought to them. But they come back after a while looking for more. And so we're getting increasingly drawn into projects, either to play a lead role or a support role to help make sustainability a real part of, of the project functionality. Sustainability is something of a buzzword nowadays, and people don't always go back to a solid grounding in earth science and ecology to define what they mean by sustainability. But if you're well grounded in those disciplines, it, it means some specific things that, you know, probably a couple hundred years ago people took for granted. We didn't have the technological ability to do things otherwise, and we had an innate recognition of how to steward our resources. So it's about getting back to those essentials in a lot of ways, and applying a lot of new technologies to do so better. Now, you were a, an industry of one when you started the company. I suspect that you have competition now. Tell, tell us about what sort of organizations you compete against. Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, we do have, um, you know, there, there is not a major engineering firm out there that doesn't, well, at least there are very few that don't have kind of a director of sustainability or a sustainability services department or something. However, um, very often we get called in to rectify project issues that have arisen because firms that have not really understood this stuff um, have taken a project from place less than successful. Um, so are those competitors or are those ultimately um, maybe proof or maybe 
out there in the industry, some people who try to step into this buzzword area without a true interdisciplinary process, they don't usually succeed. Now, I don't want to say we're the only ones out there who have capabilities, but we do have a profoundly useful set of experience and internal processes. And others that try to hop in and do it because it looks really trendy and it must be easy because a small company can pull it off, they find it's not always so. Okay, and uh, do we have any questions? Yes, we do, actually. One of the questions refers back to something Wendy said earlier about um, networks for women, um, that there are more networks available to people starting up in business. Can she mention any of those networks? Sure. Well, one thing I would really encourage any women entrepreneurs to get connected in with is um, National Women's Business Council. They, they have a website that is not just a massive maze of resources, but they do have a lot of current activities and current resources posted there. It's a kind of lean and purposeful thing. And that's nwbc.gov. Yeah, I, I just um, pulled up their website, Wendy, so people can see that. Excellent. I, I would also strongly suggest that um, the WPO, Women's Presidents Organization, is an excellent organization. Mentoring and coaching and co-counseling support to women business leaders. They don't have to be the business owner or the founder, but it really is for women who are presidents of small businesses and, frankly, some pretty large businesses as well. So WPO.org is another uh, resource I would strongly encourage people to tap. And they have chapters in most major urban areas. Okay. And my other, uh, another organization that I have a very positive uh, opinion of is WIPP, Women Impacting Public Policy, WIPP.org. Now that organization is not structured, it's really focused on the networking and mentoring resource, but it serves that purpose because it gathers a lot of um, thoughtful and politically motivated women together to do kind of grassroots lobbying efforts. And any WIP meeting winds up being an excellent networking event for powerful women. National Women's Business Council also hosts town hall meetings, and which are generally scattered around the country, and uh, various summit meetings, which are most often held in Washington, D.C. So those would be excellent resources and probably pretty convenient for many of the people on this call. Okay. And do we have any more questions? Okay. Um, yes, somebody wanted to know a bit more about her hiring choices. You obviously have some quite interesting uh, thoughts on when you hire somebody. The, I think you mentioned that, that you like people with more ex a broader experience. Could you expand a bit on that? Sure. Um, yeah, we're, we're actually looking, and I, I really sort of talk about the ingredients we might look for on a resume and in an interview process, but I'll, I'll explain a little more about that whole interview process itself. Most of the time, we really like to have people, uh, first of all, interviewed by different folks. We want to have them engaging in discussions with people, having questions and answers and use of terminology, not just within, you know, between different disciplines. We often find that's the best way to really identify people whose minds are divided into silos versus those who really say, oh, oh, now I see what you mean by that. Oh, here's my answer. And have a certain humility and a certain flexibility in how their cognitive process works. Um, so we always make sure different people interview the person. We also do some pretty detailed reference checks. We like people who have a somewhat edgy, uh, challenging quality to them. Um, and you know, we're not looking for people who are rote learners and break out the work. We're looking for people who are fine to explore innovative and creative solutions and to be able to stretch outside of their own comfort zone and help others to do the same. Uh, one, one final question, uh, Wendy, and then we'll have to sign off because I think we're over time. 
Um, how, how do you how do you handle sales and marketing? How, how does a company in your industry find new clients? Uh, how do you build your brand? Well, um, we we have a fairly selective group of clients. We are primarily government contractors. We work for federal government, state government, municipal government. We do some work for academic institutions and for corporations who typically own vast tracts of land or land on river or coastal waterfront areas. And, and so that's a fairly narrow target market, and most of those types of customers have fairly um, specialized channels for soliciting for professional services. And in general, selecting engineering and science consultants tends to be you do have to have branding. You do have to be recognized for something. A small firm like ours has to continually reassert itself and persuade people that we have something of value. You don't need to go to a billion dollar a year firm with 10,000 employees in order to get something worthwhile. That we have some very smart and talented and uniquely competent people under our very small, very green roof. Uh, but then you have to follow the Byzantine procurement protocols that federal and municipal agencies demand of you. Well, Wendy, I think we're just about out of time. Thanks for being a trooper today and for calling in on your BlackBerry from a car parked on the side of a snowy road in Boston. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you and learning about your background and the history of Bioengineering Group and your industry. Uh, thank you all for who have uh, registered today and uh, have uh, participated live in this webinar. We are recording the webinar. Uh, the webinar recording should be available as early as tomorrow. Um, uh, go to go to webinar, the service we're using for this. We'll automatically email a link to that recording to you so you can share that with others if you'd like. Uh, Wendy, we'll let you get back on your way wherever you're headed. Uh, thank you again for calling in today. Uh, thank you, Anne, for helping out. And um, My pleasure. We wish you all a good afternoon. Okay, goodbye. Thank you, Mike.